Okay, so now we got to figure out where we were at in our last session on 3.2. So do you recall where we left off? We were just at the beginning. I think we just finished 3.1 when oh, we... we were trying to get there. We were trying to get there. Yeah, so pretty, uh, uh, pretty standard. Okay, so let's go through it. Now, remember, uh, try and be as active as you want to be or can be in terms of these issues. So uh, as we start out here on 3.2, uh, equity securities, uh, we have definitional questions on the test. And so let's just uh, put some choices here for you. Recognition. And you certainly don't want to give up recognition questions. These are flashcard stuff, stuff you either know or do not know, right? And you want to save your misses for things that... Um, are either practical application. I don't want to give you given the give those up either. Uh, but I do uh, want you to say misses what are called judgment questions. You know, and you're never going to, even Dean's going to miss those. I mean, I had somebody today, I said, well, you know, what can I tell you? I, I disagree with that particular question. It's a judgment question. And that's usually a lot of times like a suitability question. And they were asking me about asset allocation. I'm kind of prejudicial. I, you know, I thought they should be a little more equitized than they were, but you know, we want to save misses for that. About 10% of that is going to be judgment questions. Now, uh, this is going to be A, B, C, D. I'll go with the high risk one first. So I say, uh, Ashley, on your exam, which of the following, A, B, C, D, pays no dividends and has no voting rights? Which of the following pays no dividends and has no voting rights? D. What? I'm sorry? D. You are correct. D is in dog, right? Treasury stock or shares, that's the most likely test question. I'll give you the others in just a minute, that have been purchased by the corporation. So, you know, as a board, we get together. Sometimes the way we say it is retired by the corporation. And remember, they can uh, they can come back out of retirement. So, you know, we assume that a company who has a treasury stock is buying back its own shares has excess capital. So if we have more capital than we need, we say, well, how can we return this excess capital to our shareholders? There's two ways we can do it. Buying back the shares or paying dividends. Uh, I was shocked because I know I've always known that Larry Ellison owns 25% of Oracle. But then I just read recently, he owns 40% of Oracle. I go, what? How did he do that? And they said what happened was that instead of paying dividends, the board of Oracle decided to buy back stock. They've been spending billions buying back their stock. And as a result, Larry's proportion ownership has gone from 25% of Oracle to 40% of Oracle. Well, uh, so when the board says, should we pay a dividend? Larry says, no, 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 no. Dividends are taxable, man. I don't want no dividend. I don't need no dividend. Let's just buy some more stock. So, and you nailed the test questions. You definitely should know that treasury stock pays no dividends and has no voting rights. Okay, let's try another one. Um, let's put that in a different color. Uh, I'll say uh, the maximum number of shares a corporation can uh, issue under terms of its charter, the maximum number of shares a corporation can issue under terms of its charter. A. You're correct. So, you know, when we set up a corporation, there's no such thing as a corporation that doesn't have common stock. You know, we got to capitalize the thing. We're going to have some common stock. And, you know, uh, we probably want to uh, authorize more shares than we plan on issuing. So maybe, for example, we uh, authorize 2 million shares. And, uh, oh, I don't know. It's kind of, I'm not sure I want to take up our time waiting for Dean to type definitions. But And maybe in my example, we choose to only issue a million of those. So issued are shares that have been placed with investors. And then the outstanding is the issued less treasury, and that too would be testable. 
Now, on a bad day, I might even make you figure it out, but you know, most of the time it's just recognition. In other words, I say, you know, they have a million shares, they bought back 200,000 shares. What are the number of shares outstanding? Now, by the way, if, in our example, if we want to go past 2 million, we're going to have to amend the corporate charter. And I've seen a lot of shares don't want to amend the corporate charter because it's potential dilution, right? We don't, you know, all this new shares. All right, so let's talk about the rights you have as a common stockholder. You have a preemptive right. You have a preemptive right. The preemptive right is your right to maintain proportion ownership. So, you know, in my example, we authorized 2 million shares, we issued a million, and you bought uh, 200,000 of the million. You're a 20% owner. And you have a right to maintain your proportion ownership. All our shareholders have a right to maintain their proportion ownership. And the mechanism used to do that is a rights offering. You know, the way I think of this is uh, you have the first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares. You have the first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares. So I'm your broker, and I call you and I say, hey, you know that uh, 200,000 shares you uh, own? You go, yeah, Dean, I'm, I'm a principal stockholder. I own more than uh, 10%. And I say, yeah. You know, and what they're doing is they're doing a uh, rights offering. They already have decided they're going to issue that other uh, million shares. And you say, well, geez, Dean, if they issue that other million shares and I don't buy any, I'm going to owe 200,000 of uh, 2 million. I go, that's indeed correct, Ashley. You're going to be cut from 20% ownership to 10. And uh, so, Ashley, you have a right to not have that happen to you. And so uh, the reason I've called is we're conducting a rights offering. Uh, test question. Rights offerings, rights are short term. It makes sense that it's short term because they need the money. The issuer needs the money and they need it like now. Right? So we're not going to test you on whether it's three months or six months. It's just that, you know, they need the money. Now, Ashley, if they can get the money from you and the other shareholders, they won't have to go to an investment banker. They can save some money. And, you know, the most likely candidates to provide us with additional capital are our existing shareholders. And so we're going to pass that savings on to you. Test question. The rights are exercisable below the current market price. CMB just means current market price, very testable. Now, can I make you participate? I cannot make you participate. Right? And you don't, you know, if you don't want to participate, then you don't have to participate. But remember, if you don't participate, the stock, the other stock will be sold anyways, and you'll be diluted. So the kind of the test point there is you can't make shareholders provide additional financing. You can ask politely, say, hey, can we have some more money, please? You know, and you might say, no, I, you know, I'm not giving you any more money. Or you might say, yeah, that sounds, let's go ahead. Let's go for it, man. Uh, I just read where Carvana is doing a uh, rights offering. They're going to their existing shareholders and saying, we're going to be selling some new stock. $350 million. And uh, the Garcia uh, father and son, uh, Dose and Trace, they said they're going to buy 126 million of it. So they're, they're saying they're going to do it. Now, what I, I thought was kind of interesting is <laughs> the bondholders required them to put up some more equity financing. <laughs> saying, well, listen, if, if we're going to buy some more of your bonds, geez, you know, you can, we want you to have some skin in the game, so to speak. So that is going to be interesting to see if the other Carvana shareholders participate or not. And now, uh, by the way, it depends on your draw. But, you know, in my Carvana example, uh, they need that $350 million. And so they can't really well, wonder about what's going to happen. So they have an investment banker standing by. So we have, as it relates to rights offerings, what are called standby underwritings. And uh, standby underwriting is used in a rights offering to make sure shares get distributed. So in my example, you say, well, Dean, uh, you know, what happens if I don't subscribe and buy another 200,000 shares? I said, well, there is an investment banker who is standing by 
and those shares will be sold. Now, a lot of test prep vendors, I think, actually go totally overboard on making you calculate the theoretical value of right trading cum or X. I haven't had anybody on debrief tell me they've had to do that. And so, you know, I have a video called All the Math Necessary to Pass the Series 7. And every once in a while, someone will send me a nasty comment going, well, you don't have the theoretical value of right in this thing. I just said, well, please look at the title. I didn't say all the math. I said all the math necessary. So, uh, but, you know, in my example, if uh, we said the current market price is five. And I told you the subscription price is four. That part is testable. Not that it's four, but this idea that you're going to get to buy it at less than the current market price is certainly testable. Right, that is, you know, you don't even know that's four, but you need to know whatever that is, it's less than five, right? So, and, uh, you know, in theory, being able to buy a stock at four when the stock's at five, that's worth a buck because in the real world, something's only worth what someone else is willing to pay. In our example, we're doubling the number of shares outstanding. And so I say it's going to take a one to get an additional share. What I'm showing you here is X rights. And so even if you don't want to, excuse me, even uh, if you don't actually want to participate, you should at least sell them to someone else because they have a value of a dollar, right? And so they'll be trading in the secondary market. So you know, that's called the theoretical value of a right. Okay, so we uh, have our pro preemptive, right? We're talking about rights and privileges you have as a shareholder. We talked about your preemptive, right? You also have a right to a dividend if declared. That's a big word. I can't tell you how many people think they have a right to a dividend and they do not. You only have a right to a dividend if declared. And, you know, the board might say, for example, on the last board meeting of Intel, uh, the board of directors of Intel said, should we really be paying dividends at this uh, time? I mean, to be honest with you, don't we need all that capital to build new chip factories and match money with the government to get some uh, chips being made in the U.S.? You know, are we competing against these huge you know, foreign entities? Uh, and the board decided until further notice, there would be no dividends. And, you know, there's probably shareholders of Intel. What? Well, I thought I was getting a dividend. No, right? You don't have it. Now, once the company declares it, it becomes a current liability. Declared dividends become a current liability. Remember what that means? That means that this is something that needs to be paid within the next uh, you know, 12 months. So uh, we have some balance sheet calculations we're held accountable for. We have some balance sheet calculations we're held accountable for. And one of those uh, balance sheet calculations we're held accountable for is working capital. Do you know what working capital is in terms of the balance sheet calculation? Current assets minus current liabilities. Right on. So I'm just going to make up one. And let's say we have current assets of uh, 40 million. I just made that up. And let's say that we have current liabilities of 10 million. And so I ask you, what is the working capital? And you say on your exam, Dean, the working capital is 30 million. Okay, so you would respond that working capital is, in this case, $30 million. And now I ask you, uh, what happens if the company declares $200,000 in dividends? So let's just come up with a declared date. I'll just make up a declared date. 
the board meets today, July 20th. This is a Wednesday, July 20th. And we declare $200,000 worth of uh, dividends. Wednesday, July 20th, declared date. And what we just say about uh, dividends, they become current uh, liability, right? So if they declare $200,000 worth of dividends, this goes to $10,200,000. And so my test question would be, what is the effect on working capital when a company declares a dividend? What is the effect on working capital when a company declares a dividend? And your choices would be uh, working capital rises, working capital falls, working capital remains the same, cannot be determined. Don't ever take cannot be determined on your exam. That is never the correct answer that you can figure it out, right? You're not allowed to tell customers, I can't figure out something. What you can tell the customer is, actually, I don't know the answer here, but somebody has the answer. Well, let me go find out for you. You can certainly say, let me do some homework. Now, by the way, we don't get too much onto this on the test because nobody expects you to be an analyst, you know, doing fundamental analysis. But we, we do have the expectation you have a general understanding. And so uh, let's just label this as uh, the declared date. And we said that was uh, 720. So the next thing the uh, board is going to do is say, okay, well, when are we going to cut the checks? When are the checks going to be cut for the $200,000? And so maybe we say the payable date is August 15th. Again, I'm just making that up. So uh, let's say now we uh, pay this thing. So if we pay the dividend, right, because now we're going to cut the checks. So when we cut the checks, our current assets go down because we just send out the checks for the dividends, right? Kind of a trick here. Not really a trick, just, just showing you the math. Uh, but now we also owe people less money, right? Because we just took care of that. And please note, if I ask you what is the effect on the payable date, there is no effect. You know, you should feel good when you pay your bills. When you pay your bills, it has no effect on your working capital, right? Because it's a wash. You've got the same, you know, less cash as you have less of a liability. So no effect on the payable date. But on the declared date, it's going to decrease your working capital? That's right. Let's, let's just label that because that was exactly what we're trying to show you here is exactly that. Decrease on the declared date stays the same on the payable date, right? So just be careful what you're being asked. The way I say that on the test is RTFQ. Are they asking about the effect on working capital when a company declares a dividend, decreases, or are they asking the effect on a working capital when they pay it? No change. Now, remember, the other day we're going to be concerned with is who are we going to pay it to? Because, you know, our shareholders are changing all the time. People are buying, people are selling. And there's a secondary market. And so the board says, we're going to look at our shareholder list on the record date. If you're a shareholder as of record, as of record, Thursday, July 28th, then you get this dividend. Again, I'm just making that up. And that's called the record date. That's when I look at their shareholder list. And if you're on the list, you're going to get the dividend. So we need to know that uh, you just don't show up on the shareholder list when you buy the stock, right? If I buy the stock today, July 20th, that's called the trade date. That's when we agree to terms. And then I'm not going to be on the shareholder list on Thursday, T plus one. Uh, when I show up on the shareholder list is Friday, July 22nd. And certainly I would be entitled to this dividend because I would be on the shareholder list on time. But if we buy this on Wednesday, July 27th, T plus one, 
we're not going to be on the shareholder list in time. Because, you know, you buy it Wednesday, July 27th, T plus one, T plus two, you're not on the list. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. And if we buy this uh, on Tuesday, if we buy this on Tuesday, mm -hmm. we would be on the shareholder list in time. So, you know, they what they love to do is put you on the cusp of some line and then make you come up with, you know, what goes on. So what I've just said is that if you buy this stock on the 26th, you would get the dividend. That's the last day you can buy the stock and get the dividend. Wednesday, test question, Wednesday, test question, is the first date, there are others, it is the first date on which the stock no longer trades with a dividend attached. And it's not coincidental. It is not coincidental. That that is one business day prior to record. It's not coincidental because regular wage settlement is T plus two. Uh, that is very, very testable. What do we call the first date on which a stock no longer trades with the dividend attached? What do we call that? The X date, very testable. You know, the X date. So a couple test questions. Uh, when is the X date? It's one business day prior to record. What is the X date? It's the first date on which the stock no longer trades with the dividend attached. Another one they love on the test is to test you on the chronological sequence. You know, in chronological sequence, it's DERP. It's the declared date followed by the X date. Record date, payable date, right? Another test question. All the followings are set by the board of directors, except all the following are set by the board of directors. The X date is not set by, or, excuse, me, excuse me, all the following are set by the uniform practice. <laughs> all the following are set by the board of directors, except and it would be the X date. That's a function of what's called the uniform practice code. The Uniform Practice Code, which standardizes practices within the securities industry. Uh, let's say that uh, in our example, we're looking at this stock. We're looking at the stock, and let's say the stock closed at uh, fifty dollars on Tuesday. And uh, let's say that it is trade uh, going to pay a seventy-five cent dividend. Well, if the company is worth $50 on Tuesday with that cash as part of the company's working capital, and tomorrow that cash will be sent out or will be sent out at a future day, but you know, that's when that's going to be payable. We would expect, test question, the stock to open up at $49.25. Right? We assume that the stock is going to go down by the amount of the dividend. So very desperate. I call you Tuesday, July 26 and say, hey, Ashley, if you buy the stock today, you get the dividend. But if you wait till tomorrow, no dividend for you. You say, well, Dean, uh, wouldn't I be better served to buy it at 49 and a quarter without creating an unnecessary tax situation? I said, well, gee, you're no fun. You say, Dean, can I talk to your supervisor? So using this X date as an artifice. Don't you love that word? An artifice. An artificial sense of urgency that doesn't exist. 
You know, now it's on. It's sad that, that on the test you got to believe in human depravity and original sin. You know that we didn't have rules. If we didn't have a code of conduct, you know, code of conduct uh, test question is the ethical behavior that broker dealers and associated persons agree to. You know, things we will or won't do. And one of the things we agree we won't do, very testable, is sell dividends. Right? So, you know, not bueno when you pass your seven, you go back to your marriage and say, I want to sell some dividends and do some breakpoint sales and do some churning and open some fictitious accounts. You know, those are all bad things, things we're not supposed to do, right? Uh, you wouldn't want your order below the market. So, Ashley, right now, let's suppose you have a uh, buy limit or sell stop on this stock at forty nine fifty. You've told me that you either want to buy it at forty nine fifty or less, or you've told me that it trades at or through forty nine fifty. You want to sell the stock, and you wouldn't want that order to be triggered as a result of this uh, dividend, right? Because remember, you're, if we didn't have this, what I'm about to share with you, the Orders below the market at 49.50 would be triggered if we didn't too adjust them for dividends. So orders placed below the market, very testable, are going to be uh, adjusted for dividends. So in my example, if you had a, a buy limit of 49.50, it's now going to be a buy limit of 48.75. You know, and you might say, well, gee, Steen, that's kind of a pain. You know, I said, you know, I said, well, listen, you're the customer, Ashley. If you don't want me to do that, I won't do it. You know, you say, Dean, yeah, don't do that. That's just a pain in the ass. So, you know, a customer could say DNR. That's a customer who says, do not reduce their orders below the market. So DNR on the test doesn't mean do not resuscitate. It means do not reduce the orders. Now, the other follow-on test question is what are the orders placed below the market? And that memory aid device actually is worth so many points because here, once again, it comes into play because I just told you that we only adjust orders that are below the market. It makes sense, by the way, because we can't accidentally trigger orders below, above the market. The only ones that could actually be triggered would be the ones that are below the market. And you remember what that mnemonic was, that memory aid device to know where we place orders in relationship to the current market price? Slabs over bliss. That's right. And so we would be talking on the test, test question about bliss. So the buy limits and sell stops are going to be adjusted for this dividend in this scenario. Now, remember, there's two types of sell stops. There's sell stops that turn into market orders and there's sell stops that turn into limit orders. Now, we associate dividends. We associate dividends with mature, stable businesses, right? We don't expect like a growth stock to pay us a dividend. We expect a company that's growing to take whatever resources they have and reinvest it in the business. So not all stocks pay dividends, but if a stock that does pay a dividend, we consider a mature, stable business. Uh, and if you receive this cash dividend, it's going to be taxable to you. That 75 cents is taxable. However, a dividend of one corporation paid to another is 50% tax excludable. I don't know if I'm spelling that right. Is it an A or I? Right, so uh, Bank of America pays an 84 cent dividend. All Bank of America shareholders are entitled to 84 cents as an annual dividend, as long as the board continues to declare it, you know, 21 cents a quarter. Uh, hey, they did pretty well. This last, they just reported their quarterly earnings, and it was a good, good, good uh, quarter. Maybe the board will decide to up it. You know, it used to be 18, now it's 21. Maybe they say, let's make it 25. Woohoo! So, you know, everybody would be entitled to their pro rata share of the dividend. It's just more exciting if we have more stock. You know, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway owns a billion shares of Bank of America. Wow. 
So that means they're going to receive $840 million in dividend income from their Bank of America stock. And only 420 is taxable. So a dividend of one corporation paid to another corporation is 50% tax excludable. P.S. It used to be 70%. And Congress changed it to 50. What's that called? Test question, legislative risk. What Congress giveth, Congress can what? Taketh away, right? All right, so I think we did a pretty good job there on uh, dividends. Uh, I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm joking, but you know, uh, I, I like this document. If I could figure out a way to, to do it where it's not so like kind of crowded and, you know, uh, I think it's a, a happy medium between, a, you know, a PowerPoint slide and a whiteboard, but, you know, uh, time for Dean to kind of clean this thing up here as we move on. And I just uh, want to give him another glance here. I think uh, pretty thorough in terms of that dividend. Uh, so, you know, again, when you're trying to decide how testable something is, you know, you can kind of make a decision by, you know, how long it took us to get off this thing about here, right? So that was, you know, big time test fodder. Access to corporate books is kind of straightforward. You know, all uh, public companies are going to file three 10Qs and one 10K. And uh, here I just told you Bank of America reported, and that was its uh, second quarter. And so every quarter you get a, uh, an, a quarterly report. It's going to have a balance sheet, an income statement. I told you, boy, Bank of America was firing all pistons, right? Their income statement is their top line, right? And all the expenses and then uh, the earnings. And then they decide of how much of the earnings, the board decides how much they want to pay as a dividend. That would, that would be called the dividend payout ratio, right? Oh, poor Goldman Sachs. I'm not losing any sleep from Goldman Sachs, but they didn't have such a good quarter. Their top line was down. Their bottom line was down. This consumer banking thing isn't working out, you know, and, you know, and they took a hit on some commercial real estate. <laughs> they were, uh, you know, Goldman was kind of accused of getting all the bad news out in the second quarter. I said, well, if it's going to be bad news, let's just you know, let's get rid of all the bad news and be done with it. And then I'll have a statement of cash flow. Now, you're going to file this uh, with your shareholders, certainly. All shareholders are entitled to this information. You're going to file with the Market Center, New York or NASDAQ. And you're going to file with the SEC as well. And that annual report is going to be audited. Now, you may have your securities, Ashley, in street name, the name of your broker dealer. And so that means whether it's this or proxy material, it's going to go instead of you to your uh, broker dealer. And the test question is, can broker dealers charge customers to forward proxy materials or communications from the issuer? The answer is no. Can your broker dealer charge the issuer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. All right. So access to the corporate books. We've talked about that. Now, in our corporate charter, we're going to stipulate what kind of voting we have. So in our corporate charter, we stipulate, we also are, uh, might even have what are called test question super voting shares. I got that on the exam last time. Yeah, it's a, a lot of people have been telling me they've seen it. So that's why, you know, you've been kind enough to let uh, people free ride in your tutoring session. So hopefully <laughs> they'll watch and they won't miss it when they encounter it. All right, so statutory is pretty straightforward. You know, before we get, get to voting, let's just talk about 34. So uh, 33 and 34 were companion pieces of legislation. And all that legislation was called the New Deal. That means the old deal must have sucked. You know, the old deal was, you know, trust me, I love it. President Roosevelt, uh, FDR, said, you know, you guys in the securities industry, I know, are not big fans of 33 and 34. But, you know, you'll thank me later because it's going to promote public confidence in your industry. Because to be honest with you, nobody has any faith in your industry as it stands today. And so 33 says, if you're going to sell brand new securities to the public, key brand new securities to the public, to the public, you have to make a registration statement. You know, that's better than trust me, you love it. So people can make an informed decision. Hence the term registered securities, very important. Unregistered securities are securities that haven't gone through that process. And then 34 is about people and places people in places. So sometimes we can get things right by just covering up the screen and saying, 
Are they asking me about paper prospectuses? 33. Are they asking me about people and places? 34. Now, prior to 34, we would have like shareholder meetings at 11.59 p.m. Alcatraz Island, you had to be present to vote. And there'd be a thug on the dock and he'd ask you how you're going to vote and you came up with the wrong answer. You know, you wouldn't be uh, at the shareholder meeting. Go say, what happened to Ashley? I, go, I don't know. I thought she was out there on the dock at one point. And so 34 says that shareholders do not need to attend meetings to vote their shares, that they can vote by proxy. And then we said that a lot of uh, customers have their securities in street name, meaning the proxy material is coming to you through your broker dealer. Right now, statutory voting. Let's say that I have statutory voting and I have 500 shares. And uh, let's say that we're voting on uh, three board seats. Uh, that's a chair. It's supposed to be a chair, anyways. <laughs> right. So if it's statutory, uh, I go 500 shares, yes, no, 500 shares, yes, no. 500 yes you know. Kind of boring. I kind of think of that as like here in Nevada where I'm coming to you from. On my propositions, I get to vote yes, no, 10 props. Each of the propositions, I vote yes, no. I think it would be much more fun if we're cumulative voting in Nevada. That means, Dean, if there are 10 propositions on the ballot, you have 10 votes. And you could spend them in any fashion you like. If, you know, legalizing cannabis is your big thing, you know, 10 for or 10 against, and then you don't get to vote on anything else. Or maybe five on cannabis and, you know, five on uh, lottery or whatever the case may be. Now, with cumulative voting, we get to multiply the number of shares we have by the things we're voting on. So in this case, I have 500 shares. We're voting on three board seats. And so test question, I have 1,500 votes and I can spend them in any fashion I'd like. So, you know, if a uh, board seat, maybe there's my buddy is running for this board seat and I put all 1,500 there but then I don't get to vote on the other two. Now, who knows? Maybe I don't care about the other two. I could vote, uh, I could vote 750, 750 if I'd like. Best question, what protects minority shareholders more? And the answer is cumulative because on any one thing, they can load up. You know, this uh, particular company, it's very rare that a company has cumulative. Uh, that more companies have statutory than cumulative, but... Uh, this company does have cumulative voting, and this guy owns 12% of the stock. He's the largest single shareholder. He has not been on the board for a long time. He's been passive, but he doesn't like what's going on with the corporation. And so he decided at the next board meeting, he's going to put all those votes on himself. Hi, guys, I'm back. Him and six guys who can't stand him. In the next board meeting, there's, we usually staggered the board so that we don't all get wiped out in one fell swoop, but... You know, the next, uh, he's not up for re-election. He votes for his attorney. It's him, his attorney, and five guys who can't stand them, right? So he's not controlling the entire board, but at least he can control a board seat or two based on cumulative voting. Now, super voting shares is where you have more than one vote per share. More than one vote per share. For example, uh, the company that made this uh, popular is the Ford Motor Company. You know, Ford went pu public in 1956, and when they went public, it was because uh, the original Henry Ford died, and the Ford family couldn't pay the estate tax, and so they had to generate some liquidity, and the only way they could generate the liquidity they needed to pay that estate tax was to go public and sell some shares in Ford, because the Ford family used to own all of it. Uh, but uh, what they did instead is they said, okay, when we're going to go public, we're going to have what are called Ford Motor A stock and Ford Motor B stock. And the Ford Motor A stock is what we're gonna to sell to the public and that has one vote per share. And the Ford Motor B stock is what the Ford family is retaining and that has a hundred votes per share. So, you know, they, we're not gonna kick the Ford family out of the Ford Motor Company because they're just gonna say, wait a minute, the Ford Motor B shares have not yet voted. And bam, right? This is very popular in Silicon Valley, right? Zuckerberg at Facebook has shares that have more than one vote per share. So even though he only controls like 20% of the stock, right, the stock he has is super voting, which means he still controls 50.1% of the votes. So, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of these. 
uh, say what you will about Elon, but at least at Tesla, when he set up Tesla, it's one vote per share. So, you know, he's one of the rare people in Silicon Valley that has a, a Tesla where there's not some super voting share somewhere. They can vote a thousand times a yes. Okay, so we said there are non-voting shares. Again, that would be stipulated uh, in our corporate charter where we actually tell you that you have no vote whatsoever. This is becoming more popular as well. So you're just along for the ride and you want to go for the long for the ride. Now, those non-voting shares would typically trade a little bit of a discount. And the cumulative, uh, the super voting shares would pay a little bit of a premium, right? Because of that distinction about whether you're going to be able to vote more than one or not vote at all, whatever the case may be. Now, um, you know, capitalism without failure is kind of like religion without hell. And we have what's called the classical balance sheet equation. And the classical balance sheet equation is assets minus liabilities equals net worth. So we don't assume that a corporation is going to sell off all the assets, pay off all the liabilities, and distribute the residual claim to its shareholders. But shareholders do indeed have a residual claim. Now, the way we test you on that is they are last in line in liquidation of a corporation. They are last in line. And we said theoretical because we don't assume we're going to liquidate. But that theoretical value is known as the book value. So I would be prepare, prepared for an answer set that says A, book value, uh, B, par value, uh, C, market value. And depending on what they're asking, you will depend on the appropriate response on your exam. If I say which of the following best represents the residual claim to shareholders in liquidation, you would say A. If I say which of the following is an arbitrary number used to set up on the books, to set up the books, you would say par value. Very important to note for preferred stock, that's 100. And for bonds, that's a thousand. I wouldn't worry about for common stock, it's a buck, but it, you know, you definitely need to know if birds a hundred and bonds are a thousand. And then they'll say, what best describes a supply demand relationship in the secondary market? And you would say market value, right? We take the number of shares uh, times whatever it's trading out in the market, and that gives us the market valuation or what we call the market capitalization. So again, very much an answer set. Uh, spinoffs. Sometimes companies uh, spin off their subsidiaries as an independent company, right? So maybe I call you and I say, hey, Ashley, you know that uh, company we own? You say, yeah. Well, I said, Ashley, by way of reminder, remember, it's a holding company. And the holding company has subsidiaries. And so maybe Bank of America decides to spin off Merrill Lynch. Not going to happen. Bank of America said to Merrill Brokers when they bought them, you're never going to be free of us. You are now captive to Bank of America. You know, we are your parent company. You, you will learn to love us. I'm joking. But, you know, <laughs> yes, there were a lot of Merrill Brokers said, I'm out. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be part of that. But anyway, so they did. We say, hey, for every 100 shares of Bank of America, his 10 shares of Merrill. That's called a spinoff. A spinoff. Uh, stock uh, acquired through a consolidation or transfer. So a consolidation, I wouldn't get too in the weeds here, but a consolidation is where we have like uh, company A and company B. And then we set up, uh, you know, uh, there's lack of imagination. Again, I don't think you're going to see this on your test whatsoever, but, you know, if it's in the test specifications, it is, you know, testable. But So here's uh, company A. Here's company B. And we're going to set up, for lack of imagination, a new entity called Nuco. And this is where we are uh, going to merge these two companies together. And so Nuco is going to be issuing shares to the shareholders of A and B, saying, uh, Ashley, we'd like you to tender your shares to Nuco. We're going to give you some shares in Nuco, the surviving entity. We say the same thing to the company B. 
And so that stock acquired to a consolidation or a transfer. Uh, you should definitely know what is a penny stock. A penny stock is a non-NASDAQ stock. Well, gee whiz, look at this. We've been at it almost an hour and we finally get to scroll a little bit. Ooh. Wow. Uh, what was the definition of a penny stock? You know that based on your pre-study? A non-NASDAQ stock, OTC stock, under $5. And there are test questions about those kind of securities. And uh, the test question is, the definition alone is testable. You know some other things about uh, penny stocks? Very testable. Instead of getting a quarterly statement, you get a monthly statement. That's very testable. We have to get a suitability statement from you. where you acknowledge that you understand as a customer that you're buying a speculative, low-priced security. Uh, the suitability statement does not apply to an established customer. If you're an established customer, I don't have to guess, give this suitability. And then that leads us to what is an established customer of a broker dealer. So, you know, it makes you an established customer. You've had fun with us for 12 months. Or you've done three or more trades in a 12-month period. And that means you don't get the suitability statement or not required to give it to you is what I should say. By the way, the suitability statement is only if I'm soliciting you. So, you know what I mean by that is, uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the merger of TD Ameritrade and Schwab as they consolidate things, but uh, TD Ameritrade has a reputation for allowing customers to do lots of penny stocks on an unsolicited basis. So, you know, TD Ameritrade isn't calling people and saying, buy crazy penny stocks, but they, they will let you put it in your account and on an unsolicited basis, you can buy and sell them. And so those TD Ameritrade customers are going to get a monthly statement, but there's not going to be a suitability statement because TD Ameritrade says that's on your own. The reason I think it's going to be interesting is uh, Schwab is more restrictive. They sometimes don't let you do penny stocks in your Schwab account. So I can imagine they're probably assuming the house recurrence of Schwab are already going to survive the merger. That's going to be interesting because there's going to be a lot of unhappy penny stock trader guys at TD Ameritrade when Schwab calls them and says, hey, no more penny stocks for you at Schwab. <laughs> You're going to have to find some other firm that's willing to uh, let you transact that type of business. Uh, it's one thing I would just uh, mention. Remember, house requirements can always be more stringent than anything we ever discuss. Right? They just can't be more lenient. They can always be you know, uh, more. They just can't be less. All right. So uh, characteristics of preferred stock. So very testable, you have preferential treatment in terms of the common. You have preferential treatment in terms of the common. That's why it's called preferred stock. You have preferential treatment in liquidation. And you have preferential treatment in dividends. Very testable. So what I mean by that is this is a senior security this is a senior security to the common. You know, we don't assume we're going to liquidate, but if we do, this is a senior to the common in liquidation. So you're second to last in line, not the reason you would buy a preferred stock. You don't buy a preferred stock because you're going to be second to last in line. Now you also, you also have preferential treatment in terms of dividends. They cannot pay a dividend to the common if they're in arrears to the preferred stockholders. So for us, that's the most more important concept is this concept of that you can't pay a dividend to the common if you're in arrears to your preferred stockholders. Now, cumulative, cumulative means if they miss it, if they miss this dividend and they miss the next dividend, it makes the decimal, it goes in arrears. 
I kind of think of the kind of like your phone bill, right? Your phone bill is cumulative. If you don't pay it this month, then next month you owe last month and this month. If you miss it again, you know, wouldn't it be a, I'm better. It wouldn't it be fun if they said, hey, Dean, it's be just try better next time. We're just going to wipe the slate clean this month. That's on us. You know, no. <laughs> Non-cumulative or straight preferred. Non-cumulative, also known as straight preferred, there's no arrears. You know, if they didn't miss it, they just try better next time, right? So uh, let's say that we're looking at, let's say we're looking at a 5% cumulative preferred. So the first thing we got to be able to do on a 5% cumulative preferred is we got to be able to turn that into a dollar amount. And that's why that par is so important because that preferred stock dividend is a fixed. You're not getting more than that. You might even get less. I mean, that's stated as a maximum, not a minimum. So even though this is equity on the issuer's balance sheet, the way it reacts in my investor's portfolio is like a bond because both a bond, test question, and preferred stock are fixed income investment vehicles. Meaning you're not going to be happy if interest rates go up. You're not going to be happy if uh, you're looking for more purchasing power in the future because these aren't very good in an inflationary environment. Right. Almost all of the suitability judgment questions, Ashley, are linked to product knowledge. Right. So a lot of times when people say, well, how can I get, how can I do better on suitability? I say, well, you know, you can't do well on suitability if you don't intellectually own the products, because then you don't know what is appropriate or not appropriate if you don't know, you know, the characteristics of that particular vehicle. You know, we, we love that on the test, by the way, the investment vehicle analogy. You know, we're in function three, 91 questions on investment vehicles and you know, these investment vehicles, how do they take you to your financial destination? Or how do they crash and burn? Where, you know, this vehicle doesn't get you to your destination, right? I always joke, Ashley, when you pass your seven, if you really want to make your manager excited to say, hey, you know, I know I have a seven. It is okay if I just sell mutual funds. They'll say, oh, that would be so wonderful. Because that's the investment vehicle that actually gets people their financial destination more often than not without crashing and burning. You know, if you come back and bring yourself and say, man, I can't wait to get busy on some naked calls and some short stock and, you know, uh, some margin, some oil and gas exploratory programs, you know, <laughs> you know, seven is full registration. So first thing we got to do is say, okay, well, that's based on par, which is $100. And we're going to take that and times it by 5%. And now we know that we're entitled to $5 annual. Boom. So that's our first thing. And then we got a RTFQ. Remember that stands for read the full question. Because before we uh, go into the scenario where they show me on the test, like they show me uh, a sequence of years, for example, they love to do that where... I show you a sequence of year, years, I say in 2019, they paid X. In 2020, they paid uh, Y, 2021, you know, and then they say something like, well, how much do they have to pay in 2022 before they can pay a dividend to come? You know, and if this says non-cumulative, you don't even have to, you just go to 2022 and say $5, thank you very much. Right, because if it's you know non-cumulative, or excuse me, then they just try better. There's no arrears. But uh, let's say on the test, I say that uh, in 1995 to 2019, they usually give you some dog and pony about you know why they weren't able to pay. It's kind of like me telling my com phone company why I can't pay my phone bill. They really, you know, I had a guy who got, I'm building a cabin off the off the grid. And the guy just sent me this electrical. Oh my god. It, the guy who did my electrical, I have a project manager and he was a subcontractor and he's telling me that he's owed more money. But, you know, Ashley, I don't need problems in my life. I'm just going to pay him. But the, what, what I didn't believe, he gave me six pages of why he needs more money and, you know, all this stuff. I mean, I don't want to hurt his feelings because he sounds like he might be a little off a little bit. I'm just going to say, hey, Ashley, not a problem, man. I Listen, I'm new to the community. I don't want anybody who thinks ill of me or my contract or whatever. So meet me at the Chevron. 
you know, I'm not bringing him back on the property, right? <laughs> I uh, don't want to come in there and tear out all his electrical stuff that he told me you know, did. So, but anyways, uh, here, let's say that they say on the test, uh, we were only able to pay $3. And then we uh, were only able to pay $2. And then they say we omitted the dividend entirely. Who say? Now, again, there's a lot of ways to do things. And as long as you get the right answer, you know, who cares, right? So, uh, you know, choice A, and be careful because, you know, you know, I don't want to scare you, but, you know, sometimes, you know, you can feel real good about a wrong answer because if there's a way to screw it up, it is one of the answers available to you, right? <laughs> and you feel good and you go, man, I thought I got that. So remember, if this is non-cumulative, the answer is A because you just got to take care of the current dividend. But more often than not, more often than not, the, the question is going to be about a cumulative scenario. So let's just uh, stipulate that this is cumulative. So what I recommend we do is that, uh, you know, we subtotal it. We say, okay, well, they owed us five and they paid us two. So now they owe us, uh, owed us five, they paid us three. So they owe us two. I got that there. And let's put that in bigger font. Boom. Uh, they owed us five. They paid us two. So they owe us another three. Plus the two. So I'm just keeping track. So now they're $5 in arrears. So I'm just subtotaling as I go along. Uh, they owed us five. They didn't pay us anything. So now they owe us another five. Plus the five they already owed us. So now they owe us 10. Now this is where most people mess up on this question. You know, choice B is going to be $10, and that's not correct either, $10 per share, right? Because not only they got to take care of the arrearage, they got to take care of what? This year as well, right? So the answer here is actually going to be $15, right? The 10 plus the current, the current that's what their arrears on, plus the current dividend. So this is reset. The company has issued a 5% cumulative preferred stock, a 5% cumulative preferred stock. In 2019, they paid $3 per share. In 2020, they paid $2 a share. In 2021, they omitted the dividend entirely. How much must they pay to the preferred stockholders before they can pay a dividend to common? Testing on two things. Do you know this is a senior security that you can't pay a dividend to common? If you're in arrears to the preferred stockholders. And secondly, can you calculate the arrearage? So they owed us five, they paid us three, they owe us two. They owed us five, they paid us two, so they owe us another three. Three plus the two is five. They owe us five, they didn't pay us anything, so they owe us five plus the five, their arrears, they owe us 10. They owe us the current dividend of 15. Now, all, a lot of time on debrief, I get people, I don't know what to think of this. Somebody had, maybe it was you, Ashley, somebody told me, I said, I don't know what to make it when people tell me they got more preferred stock questions than they were expecting. And I said, I don't know how come I keep getting that as people feedback, because I don't know how, what they thought they were expecting. And then somebody told me there's a lot of chess prep vendors and uh, corporate trainers, I guess, I you know, that tell people not to worry about preferred stock. And it's certainly not me that has ever said that, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, the preferred stock is there. So you, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want you in a position where you come back and say, you know, there's more preferred stock questions than I was expecting. I'll say, well, I don't know what kind of expectation you had, but uh, they're definitely there. All right, so uh, we're looking at uh, cumulative. Uh, we've discussed non-cumulative. Some corporations have participating preferred. That allows you to participate in excess earnings beyond some stipulated amount. That amount would be uh, stipulating the prospectus. You know, uh, I think of this, Ashley, as primarily being like cyclical companies. So you're a preferred stockholder in a cyclical company. And that means, Ashley, when things are good, they're really, really good. But when they're bad, they're really, really bad. And it's very possible, Ashley, that if you own our preferred stock, that in a bad down cycle, we might have to omit the dividend entirely, and it is straight, non-cumulative, and so we're not going to go into arrears. But to reward you for being with us in good times and bad, 
when we have good times, we'll pay you extra. We'll pay you more than that 5%. Woohoo. Now, the idea here would be to try and time that in terms of that cycle. You know, one of my uh, favorite privately held companies is called Cargill. You know, Cargill is a huge commodities firm in uh, the Midwest, and it's owned and controlled by the McMillan family. And the McMillan family not only controls it in the common stock, but they also have participating preferred in cargo. And so what they're saying is that in bad times, the McMillan family isn't going to draw money out of cargo. In other words, they're not going to demand a dividend from their participating preferred stock. But in an up cycle, when cargo is making all kinds of money, then the McMillan family says, hey, not only do we want to be paid on our common, and we would also like to get some money from our participating preferred position that we have in uh, cargo. I don't know why. I, someday, I, I'm, I'm kind of weird. I'm, I'll do some homework. I don't know why it's called cargo and it's controlled by the McMillan family. My guess, Ashley, is there's probably some marriages somewhere where there was a, a cargo who married a McMillan. And, you know, and now it's the McMillans that are running things. All right. So we're uh, talking about uh, preferred stock uh, convertible. Again, very testable. So uh, if this is a convertible preferred, you got to be real careful because remember, uh, conversion terms are based on par, right? So if on the test, I tell you that this is a convertible preferred and the conversion price is 20, I say over and over and over again to test takers, you can't do anything with the conversion price. The minute on the test, they give you a conversion price in any question. You've got to establish the conversion ratio. You've got to establish the conversion ratio. So right out of the gate, we get a convertible. We're going to say, okay, well, I need to establish the conversion ratio, which is based on par. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take par and we're going to divide that. The test is always division. So if you can't remember what, remember what to do, divide. If you can't remember what to divide, take the first number divided by the second number. It takes care of, you know, 90% of the series uh, as of a man. So five shares. And then remember the next thing you're going to have to do on the test is calculate parity. Parity is when things are equal. You know, the, the bond price, or in this case, the preferred price, equals the stock price. Or, you know, the stock price equals the bond, uh, preferred price. Right? So, you know, maybe I tell you... Uh, uh, the stock price is uh, when it was issued, uh, let's say the preferred stock was issued at 18, or excuse me, it was issued at to par 100. And uh, when this was uh, issued, the common stock was at 18. And right now, this makes no sense to convert it at 20 when the common stock's at 18. But, you know, if the common stock goes to 30, so I say just making it up here, current market price of the common is $30 a share. And I'm your broker and I say, hey, I just want to chat with you a little bit, uh, Ashley, about that convertible preferred we bought. As you recall, we can turn this into five shares of the common. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo. Our preferred stock parity is 150. That's pretty cool. What we're saying is, that equals what the stock would be at, right? If we've got five shares of a $30 stock, you know, uh, typically we would, uh, the, pair, the the thing would be trading at something more than that. We'd be trading at 155. Well, you know, we're big time winners here because we put in the money and now they've used that money we, they raised to build the business. And now we have this conversion feature, right? We might even discuss an arbit or find an arbitrage opportunity. Now, uh, more likely on the exam, you're going to get calculating parity of convertible bonds then you are calculating parity of a preferred stock. But, you know, both of them are testable. Uh, nobody can predict interest rates. And so, you know, the issuer wants to be able to call that. So call risk, very testable. 
you know, I always joke, if you want to sound like you're smart, somebody asks you about finance, investments, economics, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound good. People say, what about them? You say they fluctuate. Is that good news or is that bad news? You say, well, it depends. You know, uh, one of my favorite examples of a uh, preferred stock was uh, Berkshire Hathaway in 2010 called Bank of America and said, listen, if you'll issue 50 million shares of a 6% preferred stock in Bank of America, Berkshire Hathaway will buy every share. And Bank of America said, well, that sounds good, but, you know, 6%, oof. Bank of America said, okay, let's make it callable in five years at 105. So we'll give you call protection until 2015. Bank of America won't call this away from you till 2015. And they may not even call it then. But if they do, then they'll give you a premium, 105. And so that was the call protection. Call protection consists of two things, time and price. So call risk test question is associated with a declining interest rate environment. You know, issuers don't refinance at higher rates. They write refinance at lower rates. Please note, it sounds like actually like Keen's talking about a bond. I'm not. I'm talking about a fixed income investment vehicle like a bond. A preferred stock. And they have the same kind of risks in this regard, right? So we have call risk, and that's associated with declining interest environment. We do have two uh, investment vehicles that have no call risk, and that would be zero coupon bonds are non callable. And treasuries have no call risk. because those are not callable. So, you know, somebody says, Dean, I, I don't want to be exposed to call risk. I say, well, you can buy a zero coupon bond. Those are not callable. And T-notes and T-bonds are not callable. But other than that, we're going to have some uh, risk here in terms of call. All right, so uh, we're talking about just uh, callable. We said uh, preferred stocks are typically going to be callable. Uh, there's going to be some uh, call protection, a, a length of time where the issuer can't call the bonds, and typically a, a prepayment penalty, if you will. In terms of price, we have a adjustable rate preferreds, variable rate preferreds that move against some base rate. It used to be LIBOR, now it's SUCOR. Who cares? Whatever the base rate is. And I say this pays 50 basis points or 50 bips. You know, I want to sound like a player. You know, players don't really ever say basis points in our business. You know, if you're a player, you say 50 bips. Uh, 50 basis points is one half of 1%. So 100 basis points would be 1%. Right? The difference between a preferred that pays 5% and 6% is 100 basis points, 100 bips, 1%. The difference between uh, 5% and 7% is 200 bips. So maybe I say it pays 50 bips over SUCOR. Uh, SUCOR is 4%. Then you would tell me on the test you get 45 uh, is that rate goes up, so does your payment. Of course, as interest rates go down, so goes, so goes your payment. Right, so this thing goes down to three. Now, I have had on B debrief people tell me they, they got a, a kind of question where you just had to recognize that this is going to move up or down based on that base rate. And uh, the, the one that somebody told me they saw, which I thought was kind of interesting. Now, remember, sometimes when people say what they saw, they you know, they don't know what they saw because that you know, they didn't pass. But you know, usually, like I told you, people sixty plus, I think they know what they saw, and and you know, we we don't want to count too much on on debrief in any regard, regards whether they pass or not. Anyways, that what they said was which has uh, the least uh, interest rate risk, and what they had to recognize is that this variable rate thing, the adjustable rate would move up with the rate kind of like what a tip would do in terms of inflation, which I thought was kind of an interesting kind of a question. Okay, well, uh, sinking funds, 
you know, there's uh, two ways to finance bonds. <laughs> you know, one way is, hey, hey, I'll figure it out when I get there. <laughs> right? So, you know, I issue $50 million worth of bonds. I tell the uh, bondholders or the preferred stockholders that I'll figure it out when I when I get there. But a sinking fund is when I set aside money to fund the call. In other words, I know they've got my example, Bank of America, that's $5 billion in 2015. I can call it. And a sinking fund would mean I tell my CFO, listen, let's set up a sinking fund so that in 2015, when we get to the call date, we actually have the money to call those uh, preferred stock. You know, uh, without a sinking fund, we just figured out when we get there. You know, in 2015, we say there is no sinking fund. So how are we going to come up with the $5 billion plus? to do that you know i kind of think of it as again just like a sink right here's a sink and that's the faucet there and what i'm doing is i'm putting money into the sink and what i'm hoping is when the sink is full i have the money to pay back the bonds or to call the preferred stock whatever the case may be and by the way that would be less risk if there is a sinking fund right so if you're you call me and say, hey, Dean, is there a sinking fund or not? I say, no, well, that's going to be more risky than if, uh, you know, there is a sinking fund. You definitely, definitely have to be able to contrast rights and warrants. So as we said earlier, rights are short-term exercisable below the current market price. Whereas warrants are long-term and exercisable above the current market price. Definitely have to be able to contrast rights with warrants. You know, warrants are usually used as a sweetener. As you see here, the exercise terms. Uh, origination, what does that mean in English? The origination means you don't get these in the secondary market. These come directly from the issuer. So if you have a right or warrant, it came directly from the issuer. It's not like buying an Apple call on the uh, SIBO. You know, der other derivatives, rights and warrants are derivatives. What we mean by that is like options, they derive their performance from the underlying. But they're not uh, options in the regard that they trade in a secondary market. They may, but they're originated by the issuer. And so when you exercise either a right or warrant, the issuer receives the money, right? When you're exercising an option contract, the issuer doesn't get the money. The previous owner receives that money if you exercise an Apple call, for example. So in my example, uh, Bank of America issued 700 million warrants to Berkshire Hathaway. Wow. They issued them in 2010. They were good till 2020, long term. Uh, they were exercisable at $7.15. And at the time, Bank of America's common was $6. In 2010, Bank of America was a $6 stock. And so when those warrants were issued to Berkshire that way, they made no sense. But in 2015, Berkshire Hathaway decided to exercise those warrants. And when they did, Bank of America was a $25 stock. Woohoo! You know, I told you that Berkshire Hathaway has a billion shares, 700 million, they got through the uh, exercise of the warrants in the primary market, and then 300 million shares that they bought in the secondary market. Uh, exercise terms, we talked about that, either above or below. We talked about the relationship uh, of the subscription price above or below. Uh, underlying stock. Now, if they split the stock, I want my terms adjusted accordingly. So, you know, Bank of America does a two-for-one split. I want to be able to get twice as many shares. So that's what anti-dilution means. It means that whoever has this wants to be compensated or adjusted for whatever proportion ownership is necessary to maintain whatever the original terms were, right? The original terms were, I would be able to exercise into X number of shares, which represents X percentage ownership. All right, so uh, the two major marketplaces, two major secondary marketplaces, are New York and NASDAQ. New York and NASDAQ. And test question, auction markets, auction markets, the number one 
example they use on the test here is the New York Stock Exchange. And they will say on the test that New York Stock Exchange can best be characterized as, and you got to come up with an auction order driven market. You know, the other big market center on the test is NASDAQ. That stands for National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. And NASDAQ is the preeminent over-the-counter market. There are other over-the-counter markets, but NASDAQ is the preeminent. And all, all over-the-counter markets are negotiated quote-driven markets. Now, the point here is you got to be a little more careful in an over-the-counter market because the actually the broker term is trading against you. That's not true in New York. You know, I, I think the example of New York would be like Sotheby's and Christie's in the art market, right? They're just uh, matching buyers and sellers and taking commission, right? You know, if you are a novice in the art market and now you decide you want to be a player. Maybe you want to go to Sotheby's or Christie's where there's an account exec who has a PhD in art history, teach you everything in the world you want to know, Ashley, about art for free. And then, uh, you know, they'll say, Ashley, there's an auction coming up. There might be something there you like. And, you know, they're going to just buy or sell. Now, another way to buy art is from a dealer. And, you know, they have inventory. Nothing wrong with having inventory. But now you walk into my gallery and you ask for a quote. And then, and then we begin in negotiations. Now, I, as the art dealer, want as much as I possibly can get for my art. And you, as the buyer, want to give me the least amount possible, right? So somewhere in between there, we come up with something that works. You know, I was in <laughs> Fashion Island in, in Newport Beach. It's a fancy kind of a mall place. And, and I walked in, and there was a, this uh, a surrealist kind of thing that spoke to me. And I said, well, uh, how much is that? And the guy said, well, Dean, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. And I said, well, that may be true, but I don't know where we go from here. I mean, I'm not the art guy. I mean, I, you know, I think you're supposed to come up with the opening number and then we go from there. And if you gave me that number, I guess I could say, oh man, you're right. I can't afford it. Or who knows? I mean, what do you know about me? Maybe I can't afford it. I mean, you know, <laughs> who knows, right? But that's a quote that we started with it. All right. So uh, we also have ECNs, Electronic Communication Networks. Uh, by the way, I would warn you in a separate part of the, this outline we're working through, Ashley, that's where we, we get into the idea of bids and asks and offers and not held orders and all that other stuff. So there's a lot more about that, but it's not in this particular part of the content outline. It's in another content. Right now, what we're primarily just talking about is the various investment vehicles we have. We have New York Stock Exchange listed securities. We have NASDAQ securities. And the test question, Ashley, about New York and NASDAQ as a type of security is that it's very liquid. T plus two, you get your money, right? I was uh, joking about uh, Steve Ballmer when he bought the Clippers. He said, you know, there's other billionaires that want to bid for the Clippers, but unlike me, they don't have $60 billion in a NASDAQ stock called Microsoft. And all I need to do is call my broker, and that's what I did, and sell $2 billion worth of Microsoft to buy the Clippers. You know, sorry, Oprah. You know, there was rumors that Oprah wanted to buy the Clippers. Oprah's a billionaire. But let's be clear, Oprah doesn't have $60 billion laying in a brokerage account somewhere. <laughs> it's an entirely different kind of wealth. Right? So uh, using it to his advantage. Uh, ADR is very testable. I can't imagine any draw of your test uh, where you don't get asked about ADRs. And very testable, they facilitate U.S. citizens uh, being exposed to foreign securities. So, you know, they have, they have questions like, like you know, what, uh, what best describes an ADR? And you would say an ADR can best be described as a foreign security trade in the U.S. market, something like that. You got to pick it out of the lineup, so to speak. You know, uh, are you, I think I, you told me you're taking your 66 afterwards? Yeah, after I pass this. So, you know, uh, 66, they get a little more into this. Uh, the reason you'd want to do this is to give the portfolio additional diversification. 
And on your 66, it'll be there. Well, it's on every test, this thing about ADRs. Uh, but the one, they, the one thing they want to make sure you don't misrepresent is that AR ADRs test question have foreign currency risk. You know, they're collecting the, you know, they're doing business in the foreign currency. You have foreign currency risk. I joke, uh, one of the ADRs I usually use, Ashley, in this example is Telefonos to Mexico. Telefonos to Mexico is the monopoly phone carrier in Mexico. And so if I buy that as an ADR, they're collecting the phone bills in pesos. It used to take 10 pesos to get a buck. Now it takes 20 pesos to get a buck. And my dividend just got cut in half. So if that underlying business is conducted in the foreign currency, you have foreign currency risk. So what they try and confuse you about on the test is because I'm being paid in dollars, I am, we're going to convert the pesos to dollars. I'm going to get a dividend that is a dollar, U.S. dollars. But remember that before that, I had pesos, so you still have that risk. All right, uh, tax treatment of uh, equity securities transactions. We don't expect you to be a CPA. But we do expect that a broker has a general understanding of tax implications. You know, we don't want his accountant to tell him he needs a new broker. I say, man, your broker is so confused about things. You know, so capital gains and losses. So, uh, you know, you have three baskets uh, that you report on your tax return. You have earned income or paycheck income. You have portfolio or unearned income. And you have passive. You know, the idea here as your investment professional, Ashley, is to get enough of your money working for you that you don't need to work for your money any longer. Right? I feel pretty blessed. You know, I have enough money working for me that if I don't want to work for my money, I don't need to. You know, so every once in a while, Kaplan called me and asked me to fill in for him. And I said, I, you know, her name is Mindy. I said, Mindy, I don't li mind being a substitute teacher for Kaplan, but trust me, if you can find somebody else to do it and they want the money, give it to them because I have other things I'd rather be doing. So, you know, uh, good news for Dean. You know, Ashley, if I didn't like you, you know, and you booked an hour tutoring and you didn't like me, I said, well, no harm, no foul, Ashley. I mean, good news, Dean has money. It's like this electrical guy, right? Listen, it isn't worth it. You're lucky. I have some money and I'm more than happy to take care of you. I don't I don't want anybody out there thinking that somehow they were taken advantage of. Anyway, so uh, I ideally I get to call you someday and say, hey, Ashley, we've arrived at our financial destination. You now have enough money working for you that you no need to work for your money any longer. So you can call instead of calling in sick tomorrow. How about calling in rich? You can say, I got an eye problem. What's wrong with your eye? I can't see coming to work. My broker called me and said, I'm rich. You know, the good thing about our business is there's lots of people who do leave. <laughs> they say, hey, I just read about a, a founder of this company. He's decided he's uh, he's done. You know, he's going to call it a day. All right. So we only care about on the test this part of your portfolio. Yeah, this is the part we care about. We don't really care about your paycheck. No, I'm kidding. But I mean, we're hoping there's enough that we can dollar cost average. We can do some things with. But uh, you're going to have either long-term or short-term capital gains and losses. So we're uh, talking at the end of the year. Let's say it's uh, December, and you and I are talking. I say, Ashley, uh, I just want to go over with what happened this last year in terms of realized gains and losses. Realized gains and losses. There is no tax consequence, Ashley, to us having watched our portfolio go up and down over the year. And there's no tax consequence to the securities we still own. I mean, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax. The easiest way not to pay it is not to transact. And, uh, you know, the reason I'm calling you, uh, you know, earlier in the month is because we might actually want to engage in some tax harvesting. We might want to look at some positions where we want to take a gain or take a loss, depending on where we're at in terms of our tax return. You know, the two major impediments to investment success are taxation and inflation. So uh, to qualify for a long-term gain, now we would like to do that. And I say, well, listen, maybe we should check this uh, position before we just sell it today, just to see actually how long we've had it. Because typically a long-term gain is going to be taxed at a lower number than a um, short-term gain. 
So how long do we have to be at risk at a security to qualify for a long-term capital gain? Over 12 months. Yeah, more than 12 months. Now, be careful what Dean said. I didn't say you need to own it for more than 12 months. I said, you got to be at risk. I'm kind of hinting, Ashley, that if we six months out buy a put on a stock we own, we're no longer at risk, right? So there's situations in which we can uh, accidentally, you know, blow it on our holding, you know, period by buying a put, for example. You have to be at risk. Um, the IRS says, you know, if we sell it today and then you buy it back tomorrow, they think, Ashley, you weren't through with it in an investment. They think you're just trying to generate a tax loss and they're right. So, you know, if we don't want to run afoul of a wash sale, we can get our loss a lot disallowed. You know, we can't reestablish that position. It's a moving timeline, by the way. They're going to look at what we've done 30 days before and 30 days after. And we don't do that. We Like I just say, if we sell the security day and buy it back tomorrow, then we're going to have a problem. We're going to have a problem. All right, uh, dividends on our stocks. You know, dividends, unless they're qualified, are taxed at ordinary income rates. Uh, I wouldn't get too in the weeds on this. Wouldn't get too in the weeds on this. But if it's a qualified dividend, that means, Ashley, we bought it 60 to 90 days before the record date. 60 to 90 days before the record date. And if that's the case, a qualified dividend will be taxed at a lower rate than a non-qualified dividend. I'm not going to make you do anything. It's, again, even low probability. But if you do get it, it's simply recognizing that a qualified dividend is taxed at a lower rate, whereas a non-qualified dividend is taxed at a higher rate. All right, so, you know, if, if we have an opportunity to get, uh, have a qualified dividend, that would be better. That would be better. All right, so we're uh, talking about our long-term, short-term gains. Uh, option contracts. You know, you can trade an option contract, and all option trading is short-term. All option trading is short-term. You're never going to get a long-term gain from trading options. One test of exception. It sounds like you're going to about to give me the one testable exception, which is? Leaps. Well, you got to be tighter than that, because even if you're short a leap, you don't get a long term. The only, only thing you can do in trading an option, I'm not talking about exercise, I'm about trading, okay. is to own a long-term leap. You have a leap contract. It's the only one you could be at risk for more than 12 months. So you, you nailed it. That is the one exception. Other than that, all the options are going to be short term. And then it also will be short term uh, if we don't uh, not at risk for more than twelve months. So uh, we're going to net out this uh, portfolio, and you know we net it all out. And let's say that uh, this year's not been so good. So let's say uh, let's say here Dean makes uh, eighty thousand dollars in uh, paycheck income. Yeah, that's my earned income. And let's say in my portfolio this year, I net it all up and gained the losses. I lost us $20,000. Now, what I'd like to do, Ashley, is tell the IRS I made $60,000. I'd like to take that entire 20. The most I'm going to be able to uh, take against that paycheck income, that unearned income, there's no way that number is going to be anything less than 77000 the most I can take from one area to the other is $3,000. That is very testable, right? So in this example, I now say, okay, well, I'm going to use three, and I'm going to carry forward the remainder, which is 17. And again, we are talking here exclusively about the tax consequences of equity securities. We're not talking about partnerships. You know, partnerships is that last basket over there. And the tax question, the vast majority of them are going to be in the basket that we're talking about, portfolio. Uh, when issued securities or securities acquired through conversion. So remember this, you have a convertible preferred stock or convertible bond you convert. 
or you are a Fox shareholder and Disney gave you Disney stock for your Fox stock. That is not taxable. So you say, Dean, what do I own taxes on my Disney stock? I said, well, actually, you got that uh, through the acquisition of Fox by Disney. And so that Disney stock, you don't have any tax consequence until you sell it. And you say, hey, Dean, I want to convert my preferred stock into five shares of the common. What is the tax consequence? I say, there isn't a tax consequence. Now you have five shares of common. And when you sell the common, that's when you're going to have to figure it out. Right, so that's not taxable. Uh, calculation of cost basis per share. Uh, we just talked about purchases, exchange of convertibles. Uh, stock dividends aren't taxable. You remember what you got to do in a stock dividend or a stock split? Um, you have to you have to do the calculation for how much the new stock's going to be and how much you're getting for the shares. That's exactly right. You got to adjust your cost basis per share. A lot of times you can just shop the answer set and know I have more shares at a lower price. And that'll be the answer, right? So uh, again, if I have 100 shares, there's a 10% stock dividend, 10% uh, that's 10 additional shares. I'm getting 10% more. So as everybody else, there's been no change in my proportion ownership. Now let's say I paid uh, $50 a share. That's 5,000. So 5,000 divided by 110, my adjusted cost base is 45, 45. A uh, very testament of the difference of the tax consequence of a gift that is inherited versus a gift that was not. So if somebody's dead versus somebody's alive and they gift the security, those are two different things, right? So let's say Dean buys a thousand shares of Apple at 190. Cost basis is simply when I turn my money into the investment. So in this example, I bought a thousand shares of Apple at 190. My cost basis is one ninety per share, or one hundred and ninety thousand dollars. And let's say that uh, Dean dies, and when I die, Apple's two twenty, and I give it to my nephew. I didn't gift it to him. I didn't gift it to him. He got it because Dean is dead. In that example, test question: There's a step up in the basis. What that means is they assume that my estate just transferred that to my nephew at 220. So when you inherit shares, the cost basis, the way we say that is stepped up. It is going to be the market value at death. Okay. Let's put that in bigger font. Let's put that a different color. Now that's different. That is different than if I gift the securities. If I gift the securities to my nephew, then he assumes my cost base. So that's a little different, right? So now I'm not I'm not dead. Dean is still around, but I give it to my nephew. And so in the gift, the donee, that's my nephew assumes the donor's cost base. All right? So, very testable. Uh, cost valuation, uh, you can do it any way you want. You can do it any way you want. I have another tutoring session uh, right after us, and uh, she sent me her list of questions like you sent me. Uh, her list actually is much longer. <laughs> I said, oh, my goodness. Anyways, one of them is this uh, question. I think it's way more complicated. Good news. I mean, all the ones she wants to talk about, kind of like the two I told you I didn't do, are, I think, you know, uh, hard questions. So, you know, they're, you know, in the, the minutiae's uh, area category, right? I want to I want to make sure people stay on the broad avenues and highways. But anyways, what the question was about, and they asked her, asked her to do the math, which I don't think they're going to make her do, do on the test. But they uh, had uh, somebody who had been buying some securities. And the question, the, the capital and practice question was asking, what would they want to do? Would they want to do uh, uh, average shares? Would they want to do uh, last in, first out, first in, first out? And, um, you know, we're going to go over that when I get with her. But basically what the customer wanted to be able to do is identify the shares that they had the highest cost base on. 
because that would result in the lowest tax. So what she should have done is gone through that kind of question and say, okay, well, he's got these shares that he's been buying over several time frames, and here's the ones that he has the highest cost base on, and those are the ones you should sell. Now, um, I don't think they're going to get that as much as that as knowing that if you don't keep good records, the IRS is going to impose upon you FIFA. So that is a test question, right? I always joke, if you get asked about a tax question, you're not quite sure. You should answer whatever generates the most for the U.S. Treasury. Because that is the right answer, right? So first in, first out will be imposed by the IRS. And yeah. I think I might have told you that I got the corporation question with taxes. Like, oh, what's the, the tax I'm sorry? Yeah, like what the tax consequences is if they switch from FIFO to LIFO. Oh, well, that, that, I think that one was inventory, was it not? Um, and on the, the effect on earnings per share? Yeah, I believe. So there's a, let's just go over that real quick. So I have a little video called LIFO or FIFO because, you know, it's on the test in different contexts. So another area where LIFO shows up and FIFO shows up is an in inventory valuation of a corporation, right? So if I'm buying widgets and then the inventory, and now I'm selling widgets, you know, the difference between my cost and what I can sell my widget for is my margin. And so the question there would be, what would typically have the higher margin? It would be if I evaluate my inventory at FIFO. If I assume the widgets I'm selling today are the widgets I bought first, my margin is typically going to be larger because those usually have a lower price. Whereas if I assume in my inventory valuation LIFO, we're more conservative, right? LIFO last widgets into my inventory, the first ones I'm selling, my margins are going to be smaller. And that means my earnings will be less. However, you know, whether that's good news or bad news is something we, we you know, is a strategic decision by the board and the business, right? You know, a lot of people want to minimize taxes. So I may not, it sounds silly, but I may not be interested in reporting earnings. You know, it's, you better not tell the IRS that, right? But, you know, you should never tell the IRS you're doing something to lower your taxes. You, you can say, hey, I gave taxes a consideration, but you don't want the tax tail wagging the investment dog because then you can get in trouble. But yeah, right. Well, good news, good news. You know, uh, sometimes they call the Series 7 the stockbroker's test. The stockbroker's test. I think it should be called truth and labeling the bond broker's test. There's way more questions on bonds and stock, but basically 3.2 was all about common and preferred stock. It was all about the equity capitalization of a corporation equity. The two ways we capitalize corporations with equity, there's no such thing as a corporation that doesn't have common stock. And then we may choose to further capitalize the corporation through the issuance of preferred stock. And we might decide to issue some bonds. That's a separate section of this content outline. And the next vehicle that we want to talk about, we're talking about ownership, are packaged, what are called packaged products. This is very testable. So I tell people the three biggest areas of the Series 7 are options, munis, and packaged products. That's mutual funds primarily. Each of those are 20 questions, give or take, plus or minus. And I think people sometimes underestimate the... Uh, number and how important mutual funds are you know i i hear everybody in social media make sure you got options make sure you got munis i i always feel like tagging on and saying well don't forget mutual funds you know because they're there too nav and public offering price and all that kind of stuff uh, i just had somebody the other day who uh, missed a, a question on this about the type of mutual fund it was a bad miss because uh, they had said it was an equity income fund but then in the question it said they own bonds you know, I'm pretty honest with people when they have a bad mess. I said, well, you know, it, it, he was the session before you. And I was just saying, well, you know, that's not a bad mess. I mean, you know, that's like your thing about the dividend on the SMA. I'm like, that's not a bad mess. Who cares? You know, but when you when you miss one like that, boy, angels weep for you because, you know, you can't be giving up the, the what I call the layups, right? Um, he had a question about uh, ETFs and UITs, and we're going to talk about those. These are the, the areas we're going to be discussing. And what you got to be able to do is contrast them. You got to be able to contrast investment companies, ETFs, and UITs, how they're alike, how they're different, all that kind of stuff. 
So we have uh, as many different types of securities that we have. That's how many mutual funds we have. So we have equity mutual funds. We have uh, fixed income or bond funds. We have money market funds. Money market funds, very testable. You say, what's in a money market fund? I say, oh, that was on my Series 7. High quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. Like what? And you say like, uh, oh, that was on my test too. Like commercial paper, like bankers acceptances, like negotiable jumbo CDs, like T-bills. Interval funds are testable. Interval funds only allow you to redeem in certain time frames. You know, so you, you can, uh, you know, exchange or redeem in, at this date. And then the next date will be the next time you can uh, redeem. And so if you get a question about an interval fund, I think it would be something about lack of liquidity, right? Because you just can't redeem it any time you'd like. You know, for example, sometimes we, uh, business development companies are sometimes organized as closed-end funds where you can only redeem in intervals. I definitely got to be able to contrast to open-end with closed-end. You know, I have a slide uh, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe use this as an excuse to post that slide again. And I think it is the most target-rich slide in, in almost every exam. And it's a slide that just distinguishes between open-end and closed-end funds and all those differences. The biggest one is this idea of a secondary market for a closed-end fund, whereas an open-ended fund is continually offering new shares to the public. Now, what we're trying to do is match the investment objective of my client with that of the fund itself, right? So, you know, I kind of joke, it's like tender for mutual funds. Are we going to swap left or are we going to swap right? We're hoping to find something that matches what it's doing. So we have value funds, growth funds, income funds, uh, balance funds, international funds, sector funds. Uh, test question, some funds are more aggressive than others. And a sector fund, is diversified, but only within its sector. You know, the three major reasons somebody buys a mutual fund is professional management, ease of owner uh, diversification, and uh, ease of ownership. It's just easier owning mutual funds than it is a portfolio of individual securities. You know, so as I said, pretty testable. I say, you know, Ashley, do you have the time, temperament, and expertise to be managing money? You know, a vast majority of our prospects who we ask that question to are going to say no. I say, well, Ashley, if you don't have the time, temperament, and expertise to be managing money, I would strongly recommend we hire a professional. And you say, geez, you know, I don't know if I have enough money. I've been watching TV and I see these ads, Dean, where they say, these investment advisors where their minimum relationship is like a half a million dollars or some crazy thing. I mean, geez, it sounds like, you know, they don't have anything against poor people. They just don't like talking to them. I said, well, Ashley, you know, some mutual ones have a minimum investment as little as $500. You know, the easiest way for most retail investors to access professional management is in the context of a mutual fund. And you say, well, geez, I mean, they've managed my $500. I said, Ashley, there are men and women who have sold their soul to manage that $500 for you. Very testable. One of the major risks in investing, major risk, is selection risk. Picking the wrong thing. And very testable. The easiest way to avoid selection risk is diversification. You know, money is like manure and you have to spread it around. You know, as says uh, Bernard Baruch. So the easiest way to avoid selection risk, also known as test question, non-systemic risk, is to diversify. And the easiest way for most people to do that is in a mutual fund. Now, test question, even though you're diversified in a mutual fund, you still have systematic risk or systemic risk. And what we mean by that is risk prevails despite your diversification. Right, so that's testable to know that you know you still have the risk, the market risk of this, and a mutual fund. Boy, diversification is one of those just key tenets of investing. Right, to be probably diversified, and then it's just easier to own. Now, the reason that triggered me to kind of go into the annotation here 
is that we do have a measurement of a fund or stock's volatility as compared to the market, right? Because in a mutual fund, you are in the market in a big way. Now, and your returns are going to be correlated to the market. And so the market is best expressed as the S&P 500. And so uh, what is a measurement of a fund's volatility as compared to the market as a whole? Gotcha, it's beta. Beta. So the alpha would be what you're seeking. What you're seeking would be something better than that. So let me just start with an index fund. An index fund has a beta one. Right? If you put your money into the, the Vanguard S&P 500 index fund, it has a beta one. Whatever the market does, you're going to get. In fact, actually, what you're basically saying there is that you're willing to accept a market-based return, that you're not after any alpha. All right, there's no alpha in an index fund. No, seeking alpha. Now, if I really thought I was a good money manager, I would only charge you on the alpha. So here uh, I'm talking about a sector fund. And a sector fund typically has more volatility than the other types of funds because it's diversified, but only within Mexico or the tech industry, uh, whatever the case may be. You know, I had a guy who does mutual funds for a living. He goes out and does uh, 401k seminars. And he said a guy came up and asked what fund should he pick to retire in five years. And he said, you know, I told him we just don't have a fund with a high enough beta to get you from there to here to there, right? So, you know what, we might want a fund with a, a high beta. I said, well, listen, we, we need to get to your financial destination. I wish we would have started sooner, but we didn't, Ashley. So, you know, we're going to have to be a little more aggressive than I would like. And that sector fund would be aggressive. Right? It'd have a, typically have higher risk, a higher beta than some other funds. Now, life cycle funds are kind of interesting. They kind of follow you around. You know, you pick a, a fund based on life cycle, and as you get older, the fund starts rotating the asset allocation from equities when you're equities and not many bonds when you're younger to when, you know, you're older and you got bonds and stuff like that. Uh, you know, many different products over there. So we're always doing business in an open end fund based on the calculation of the NAV. Now, if you want to start your own mutual fund, I don't know why you would. But if you want to start your own mutual fund, you would have to comply with what's called the Investment Company Act of 1940. You know, there are more mutual funds than there are Taco Bells. In fact, there are more mutual funds than there are securities to put into them. But, uh, you know, you want to do that. And one of the things that uh, the Investment Company Act of 1940 says is that we have to calculate the NAV at least once per business day. So once per business day, usually close the market. We're going to figure out the assets of the portfolio, the stocks in the portfolio, the investments in that portfolio, less liabilities, gives us NAV. We divide, we get NAV per share. And you say, well, Dean, I want to invest $100,000. How many shares am I getting? And I say, actually, I don't know until we do the next calculation. You say, Dean, I want to redeem. You know, good news, when you redeem within seven calendar days, we give you back your, your money. But that's based on the NAV, so I don't know, Ashley. So the concept that we're always doing business based on the next calculation of the NAV is very testable. And that's called forward pricing. Forward pricing. Now the NAV plus the sales charge, the NAV plus the sales charge equals what we call the public offering price. And so I'm just going to make up an example here of that. And so I'm just going to make up an NAV. And let's say we calculate the NAV and it's $9.15. I just made that up. And let's just say the sales charge is 85 cents. I just made that up. What is the public offering price? It would be $10. And as we said, we're going to be doing that every day. Now, some funds will let you go from fund A to fund B. Uh, P.S., by the way, if we wanted to figure out the percentage sales charge here, we would take 0.85, we would divide by 10, and we'd find out this mutual fund has a sales load of 8.5%. Um, that number is testable. 
the maximum sales charge a mutual fund can charge is what? Eight and a half, right? So if we did this and we came up with something more than eight and a half, it better be a closed end fund or somebody's in trouble. Now, I kind of joke about this. I mean, I don't know of any funds anymore that charge eight and a half. I mean, that's kind of way out there in today's marketplace to be charging people eight and a half. But the technical name for a fund charging eight and a half is a full service fund. <laughs> If you're charging somebody eight and a half percent, you got to show them a lot of love. You got to give them a break point. You got to give them a letter of intent and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's uh, most of us don't charge eight and a half is the point. But that is the maximum. That is the maximum. So funds will allow you to go from fund uh, A to fund B within their family of funds. That's one of the advantages of a family funds, you know, like uh, American funds or Franklin funds. However, that is a taxable event. It is a tax of lift. Now, uh, Vanguard's fund looks like this. Vanguard has NAV plus sales charge equals the pop. But in uh, Vanguard, it's going to be the NAV 915 plus zero. Wow. There is no charge, sales charge. So NAV plus zero means the public offering price is $9.15. That would be a no-load fund. Now, some mutual funds have what's called a 12B1 fee, a promotional expense. Paid by the fund for, you know, advertising, marketing, to pay brokers, that kind of thing. You know, uh, if Vanguard wanted to, Vanguard wouldn't do this, but if Vanguard wanted to, they could charge a promotional expense on the $4 trillion there. And boy, would that buy a lot of advertising and sales literature. And uh, they could only charge so much and still refer to themselves as a no-load fund. What is the maximum 12B1 fee that a no-load charge could charge and still refer to themselves as a no-load fund? 0.75? Oh, close. So that means it's up in your brain housing group. So that's where we want it. We want it up there. But for a no-load fund, it's 0 0.25. 0 0.25. Now, I'll give you a chance to redeem yourself. Now, I'm asking to pull things out of the stratosphere. So remember, on the test... You're going to have an answer set. And the most that you can go, once you go past 0.25, you can't refer to yourself as a no load fund. And uh, we have what are called C shares. So we're going to be talking here. We'll finish up today with A shares in a mutual fund, B shares in a mutual fund, and C shares in a mutual fund. Different share classes. Most mutual fund families just do A shares anymore because they go, man, these. Share classes are confusing to reps and to customers, which is go with the traditional A share. But that being said, in a C share, there's typically going to be a, a promotional expense. And the most we can charge over the life is what you gave me that answer to, and that was 0.75. That's what it means. Right? So this is where you can, uh, can still call yourself a no-load fund. You go past that, can't be holding yourself out as a no-load fund. But in those circumstances, can you go past that? Three quarters of 1% over the life. Now, an A share has a front end low. Pretty straightforward. I say, Ashley, if you invest, uh, when I was a baby broker, retail broker, I sold a lot of the Franklin ones. That was kind of my go to thing as a baby broker. Ashley, are you interested in tax free income? You are. Hey, how about I send you some information on the Franklin California tax free fund? You know, and you invest $10,000. I say, Ashley, the load is 4%. So 4% on 10 grand means, you know, $400 isn't going into the fund. 9,600 is going into the fund. That's a traditional front end flow of an, an A share. You know, the A share is good for somebody who has a large sum and has a long-term time horizon. Uh, a B share has a contingent deferred sales charge. And that's good for somebody who has a longer term horizon, but less money a contingent deferred sales charge. 
Now here, what we need to make sure is the person understands is that uh, they're, they're uh, not an old fund. So I say typically a fund actually says, if you'll go for the B share, which has a contingent for sales charge, after three to five years, they'll waive it for you. And it'll turn into an A share. So A shares are good for large investments long-term. B shares are appropriate, suitable for somebody with less money, long-term horizon. Long-term meaning they can be in it long enough to get the sales charge waived is what that means. And then the C share is not going to be good for over the long term because if you're paying three quarters of 1% forever, Ashley, wow. I don't know, fourth, fifth, sixth year, maybe you should have paid me 4% once and be done with me. Then it'd be paying me three quarters of 1% forever and ever. Now, so that means the C share would be better for somebody with a shorter time horizon. Uh, P.S., Whatever share class I pick for you, I got to make sure I'm picking the share class that's in the client's best interest, right? I mean, we have what's called Regulation BI that says that whatever share class I'm going to be using, I got to pick the one that's best in the client's. I can't tell you how many people get in trouble for this all the time, you know, with FINRA and, you know, not putting the right share class in the right account. You know, it's, un it's unfortunate that we have to believe in human depravity and original sin, you know, <laughs> when we're doing these things. Okay, well, that looks like we got all the way here to uh, packaged products on closed in funds. Woohoo. And uh, if you'd like, we can uh, continue on on our next uh, session from there.